Hi Kelly, um, Hi. Th thanks for meeting today and, and having a conversation. Um, I think it'd be great to hear about your career history and how did you end up becoming president? Well, thanks for having me. It's nice to see you, Emma. And um, gosh, where did I start? Um, so funny enough, my undergraduate university degree is actually in advertising and public relations. So I thought I would go work in media at a PR firm or something along those lines. But quite frankly, had to uh, had huge school loans graduating from the U.S. and took the highest paying job I could find, which was a sales job. And actually thrilled that that's how I started my career. I think sales grounds you in, in why people actually buy something and how to deal with a lot of different people and, and make the most of different relationships. And so I started my career that way. Um, sold large scale energy projects for a company that Schneider eventually purchased and then actually left Schneider for five years, went back to business school, wanted to get my MBA, uh, went to work for another large U.S. industrial company, and then came back to Schneider um, almost 12 years ago now, which seems like a lifetime ago, yeah. but it's flown by, and came back on the side of the business that I didn't really know, which was really the power side, um, which is the bread and butter of Schneider and what we do. And so have taken sort of progressively different roles along the way. I've done product management, internal strategy, but ultimately knew I really loved running a business and working with mm -hmm. our people and, and being customer focused and customer centric. And so uh, series of different opportunities and then um, moved to Europe four years ago, um, first in Ireland and then now here in, in the UK. And that has completely evolved my career and, and who I am as a leader as well. So it's been an interesting journey. It's funny that there's similarities whilst, you know, when I started my career, um, I intended to go to university mm. and I did one year and then thought, I need money. Yes, <laughs> I, I know. To, uh, it drives a lot of choices <laughs> in life. I, I, but something that resonates really with me is around that customer piece and mm. people. Um, and I'm very curious and just like to be nosy. So I think finding out about yeah. people, whether that's customers or, or people you work with, colleagues, that sort of shaped me and my uh, um, and I've always worked in that type of area, but in many different industry mm. sectors. So I've been at RS nine years this year. It goes by so and, fast. and I cannot believe it that, and this was a complete pivot for me to choose an industry mm. that industrial distribution didn't really understand what it was or the breadth of the products and, and all of that that we do. But again, it's the people that have mm -hmm. made it such a a fantastic um, journey over those nine years and get to meet people like yourself that, you know, I think ultimately all we're trying to do is make a difference, whether that's internally or externally. Well, and I, I think it's um, interesting in the sense that I took the highest paying job because I, I needed to pay back all these school loans, which is more the system in the U.S., and then ended up staying in industrials. Mm -hmm. I did a brief three-month pivot. Uh, my MBA internship was, was, was with a large consumer product goods company. Yeah. And I realized I didn't feel as compelled um, by that sector and sort of that consumer orientation as I did by the B B2B mm -hmm. experience that I've gotten both with Schneider and another company. And so sometimes you have to experiment a little bit as well to figure out where you fit and where yeah. you can offer real value and, and try things differently. So how did you end up picking RS? What was sort of the reason behind such a pivot? Really, it was because it was an industry I didn't know. Mm. And, you know, my learning and development has always been within an organisation. I want to learn and I continue to learn and develop because we never stop learning. Uh, but I've done that at the different organisations that I've worked with. So I was attracted to RS because it's, you know, a global organisation mm -hmm. which would present opportunities, but also something completely different that, that I didn't know or understand. And really, I was going to experiment mm. and, and go, do I like this? Does my philosophy around people, customers translate to any sort of industry that, that could make make a difference and be fulfilling. I think the one thing I did notice, which was a shock because I'd worked in telecommunications, mm. financial services, was that when I came into this industry, how male mm. dominated Absolutely. it was. And I'm not sure how I felt about that at the time. And actually, when you were at meetings, 
there was nobody that looked like me, mm -hmm. <laughs> let alone... <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> let alone, you, you know, it made me think of then, well, what about people from different ethnicities and cultures? There is definitely that nobody mm -hmm. that looks from, like them, whether it's male or female. But it really made me start to think about what difference do I want to make to this this industry? How, how did you feel? It, yeah. Because you resonates with you. Um, I think, you know, as a 22 year old, when I sort of got into more of the buildings side of this world, um, every customer I had was male. I started in a grad program that was nine people, two women, seven men. Mm -hmm. um, in Schneider today, that would never happen. You'd have a much more um, diverse group of people starting yeah. in a grad program or an apprentice program. But that was what it was 20 years ago. You know, I, I, my mentality has always been go do a great job and that the performance and the work ethic will result ultimately in sort of where you and I are both here today. Yeah. And I never really let it bother me. There were definitely times that you walk into a room, it's a little bit lonely, nobody looks like you. I just always took it as an opportunity because actually, if you're a pretty big personality, which I am, I'm, mm -hmm. I think you are too, it's hard to ignore me in a room yeah. when I have a perspective on something. And so sometimes actually you feel like you're not just talking about what you're trying to push, but you're also trying to bring a lot of other people along with you, yeah. even if they aren't in the same room. And so I have always felt this, as I've risen in the ranks, a great responsibility to create a space and to represent women well, to show that actually diverse backgrounds can make you a better leader. Mm -hmm. So I'm not an engineer. There's this is a very engineering uh, heavy company, but actually that means I look at issues differently. I look at our customers differently. I, I bring a different perspective to the table as I think a lot of people with different backgrounds do. Exactly. So, you know, we're certainly now trying to hire not just women, not just sort of diversity of, of backgrounds or thought, but also people who have a totally different experience. So. You know, we have people who are, were in the army, as an example, the British army, who are excellent leaders because they were under different circumstances to, to figure out how to learn, how to lead and, and different uh, opportunities. So for us, it's about the more diversity you get across everything, the better we'll be as a company because our customers look like that as well. Yes. So we need to reflect who our customers are. And I would say, much like you sitting in this seat, a lot of our customers or people who are our partners look really different than they did 20 years ago as well. And so we need, we as a company are evolving to make sure we, we just cover all those different aspects. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. You know, over the nine years at RS, specifically, I would say in the last four to five, there's been a real impetus in, in why it's so important. And I think what I've been most impressed with at RS, we've got employee driven groups sure so we've got groups of just colleagues that are, feel so passionate about something whether that's driving you know diversity to get more female leaders especially in sales mm, um, absolutely where th there's a, there's a big void and how do you attract women from different professions and with different experiences into that without them thinking you have to be a technical expert to mm -hmm. LGBTQ plus to even a group called Bloomers. So it's under 30s that I like that the have, name <laughs> uh, that they come up with it that actually work together to try and educate because we're in this multi generational. You, you Absolutely, know, five generations now. working at one time now. Exactly, where they're, they're, they're trying to educate, how, how do you get the best out of me, but how do I understand understand you? And I've really seen that the colleagues that are passionate about it are really driving that agenda, which is informing our recruitment approach, hmm. which is informing our development approach. Um, and so it's it's a bottom-up and a top-down yeah. approach that I've been really proud it's of. It's interesting. Um, this year, for the first time, it sort of hit me that I'm right smack in the middle of my career. So I'm not 22 anymore, yet I really remember those days. <laughs> yeah. I remember my grad program. I remember working on construction sites to, to mm. learn sort of our industry. And I also then am realizing, gosh, I, I'm maybe not that far away, you know, another 15 years from retiring. God, that's a different world. Yeah. And and so actually, I think I'm in this really interesting place right now with all of our employees to, to actually feel all ends of this five generations and, and really understand this perspective, which 
10 years ago, I wasn't there. You know, I still was like in this early talent mode. Now I'm definitely not there and I feel a little bit more middle-aged, <laughs> but it's actually really useful because like you, we I don't know that we have as creative names as the bloomers, but we certainly have a really vibrant women's group mm-hmm. that um, wasn't even here two and a half years ago when I started, but we started and it's now all employee led. And there are lots of men who are very engaged because still in our industry, you know, 75% of the leadership you know, frontline leaders are are male. So you're going to deal with a lot of different diversity and how do you evolve. Um, And we decided last year to start something called our Leadership Pulse community, which is basically our 250 people managers that are in the UK and Ireland. And part of that was because the expectations of leadership are changing and evolving. What I expect for them to deliver to their employees and to our people is different. But how do we actually equip people to have those conversations and to understand? And to your point, how do we take a first line manager at 30 and say, actually, I want you to talk to somebody who's been a manager for 30 years and understand the mistakes they made and and the advice they would give. And actually, how would you be your own leader and your own manager in those ways? But how would you gain some experience from different people? Because who I am is very based on my own life experience, as is yours. And so there, I want people to take things away, but there's so many perspectives. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to do some things that are a little bit different um, to engage our leaders, to help them think differently and to take a lot of different experiences and and make them their own in some ways. So you have to experiment a lot these days with what will actually work to, to help guide the teams and guide our people and continually come back to our customers. Yeah. And yeah. partners and and how are they working and how do we help them and how do we engage with them and how do we learn from them as well which i think is what mm. you and i are trying to do together as well yeah absolutely so w- what legacy do you want to leave mm. behind from from you know oh, gosh diversity inclusion perspective and, yeah. and shaping schneider for the future i want this to be a great place to work yeah at the end of the day that's i want people to be attracted to us as a business i want people to see that they can grow their career here regardless of who they are what their background is i want to show that we're a meritocracy so you get ahead based on hard work and smarts and being uh, loyal to our customers and to your team and to your people and then very sort of systematically, um, I want more diversity in the room. And so for us at my staff level, as an example, there are more women in the room now. Um, We just appointed a female business leader to run one of the business units, which prior to when I was in Ireland, we hadn't had for a couple of years, which just kind of wasn't okay for me. And I'm very passionate about uh, women running operations and running businesses and owning a P&L because I think so many of the choices in a business are made by the people who own the number. Yeah. And so I think to get true diversity, um, you, you need more of that. And then I'm, I'm hoping that we're setting a stage that says trying is okay, failing is okay, um, looking at new business opportunities for us is sort of who the company is because yeah. the company that I joined 20 years ago in my first stint, maybe longer than 20 years ago now, is very different. Mm. And so we're all trying to learn and grow and that you can do that here as a company, as a as an individual. And those are the kinds of things that I think we're, we're trying to do that, that it's not just about gender, although an important piece, but that it's diversity of thought, diversity yeah. of background, diversity of experiences. To, to your earlier point, there's um, four people on my staff now that started as apprentices. Most people don't, And we don't share that enough, I think. So most people don't um, look at that and say a vice president of a big multinational started as an apprentice, but they actually did for a lot of different reasons, because they weren't ready for university, because they were super technical. And that was what was interesting for financial reasons and family reasons. So there are a lot of different paths to success. And so for me, for our employees, it's important that we talk about those paths. Yeah, I I agree. There's my... My legacy that I want to leave behind because I'm closer to the end of my career rather than <laughs> the start or the middle is, you know, I want leadership within RS to represent the society that we live in. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, we're doing something at the moment with neurodiversity because okay. we want people to talk about it and, and not feel that it's a label because people with neurodiversity have many, many different skills that 
will suit different parts of our business and they can thrive. So I want to ensure that there's a, an environment where people feel they can fulfil their potential mm. and be really flexible in trying different roles to, to work out their career path. But also, I want, like you, you know, owning a P&L is really at the heart of it, it and, is. And, and driving the business forward. Um, so I want to make sure that there is definitely a more diverse group of people that are driving those and owning those p and Well, and I think when it comes down to it, every piece of research that comes out shows diverse teams perform better. Yeah. At the end of the day, you and I own a number. Yeah. And we are responsible, you know, the way I put it is that I'm responsible for 4,000 families, yeah. ultimately in the UK and Ireland, and what happens with our business and, and ultimately then what affects those families. So I'm going to put together the best possible teams I can to ensure we deliver our commitment to the group. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's interesting, I talked to so many business leaders, and we're all trying to figure out a lot of these topics. So neurodiversity, as an example, is one I'm starting to hear more and more. We're also trying to figure out our approach around senior talent. Yeah. So we have so many people who have been here for a long time. We, we have a, a, a loyalty topic in the sense that we have a lot of people who have been here 30, 35, 40 years, their whole careers here. And they're, that knowledge that if we lose is going to be a huge issue for the business and for our customers and for our young people. How do we take that knowledge and transfer it? How do we find different working patterns for people, which five years ago we maybe wouldn't have considered, but now we definitely want to understand and consider. So the journey of a leader now, I think, is really hard. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's the greatest um, gift, as I always mm -hmm. say. It's a very humbling task, but it's also a real challenge to try and figure out which topics are gonna move the needle, which topics do we need to address, and which topics do our people want us to address, yeah. um, which for us is something we're always trying to listen to and, 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 and think through. Yeah, and I, I think that links nicely to the whole ESG agenda, mm, because, absolutely. You, you know, lots of people <clears throat> rightly so focus on the E environment, and, and you know, it'd be nice to get your thoughts on that, mm. but also, the S for the social impact, um, because I think many people now want to join an organisation that they connect with, mm. you, you know, that purpose Certainly. Um, and how how it's not just about the organisation and benefits, it's do the moral values fit and the social impact organisations and then obviously doing business responsibly and, and mm -hmm. that the whole ethics piece. But from a sustainability element, what what are you driving in Schneider? And yeah. Well, um, you know, Schneider's evolved, I would say. When I started way back when, we talked a lot about energy efficiency and reducing your energy usage. And was and that was a topic certain customers were interested in. And then at the base of the company, we're also an incredibly strong product-oriented company. I would say in the last couple of years, we've seen this material shift around practically every large company and certainly more and more SMEs caring about their footprint. Yeah. Um, what are they doing from a sustainability perspective? And then I think the geopolitical topics of the last year in which energy bills have gone up substantially and costs, which are changing the nature of how companies have to spend their money. Yeah. If you look at the fact that a lot of people, their bills have gone up two and three X. Well, if you're running a large industrial plant, it is a huge, mm -hmm. huge topic. So I think we start with mirroring what we think people should be doing. So in our own factories, in our own offices, we are moving towards an all electric environment. So you won't see us in office buildings in a number of years in which they aren't operating as all electric. Yeah. Moving away from gas and, and both from uh, what it does to the environment as well as some of the geopolitical things. You just won't see us mm. in those environments. Translating in our own factories, how do we need to be doing business? What's the process moving forward? Because if we want to go advise people on what to do in their factories yeah. or their distribution centers, we need to be doing it in ours. So that's sort of one huge component of what we do where we have our own internal sustainability that, that we're thinking about. And then obviously the business side is growing substantially around how are we advising customers? What kinds of things can they do? And a lot of the software portfolio that Schneider's bought in the last 10 years or developed internally is all around helping to manage yeah. usage. 
And so the company is evolving. So the company that I joined 20 years ago is not the company of today. And a lot of that has also grown out of opportunities in the market. So it's a balance for us, yeah. I think, between what we're doing internally, but also how we're helping customers. How are you guys thinking about this as well? So, you know, we've seen a material shift with our customers from going, this is something I should be interested mm -hmm. in caring about to going, no, with everything that's happened, as you say, in the past couple of years, we really do need to do something, not just for ourselves, but the, the greater good. So more and more customers are saying, what help can we get, mm -hmm. you know, reducing energy bills, understanding where, how, how efficient and sustainable we are, but also challenging us on packaging, on our, Absolutely. our supply chain to make sure that our morals fit and our values and our mm -hmm. ethics and our behaviours. So much so that we've launched the Better World product. So that's working with mm -hmm. suppliers and partners where we can go, right, we can tell our customers you know that these are going to help and they're from a sustainable that you can track your supply we, chain and that know we what can you're doing. track yeah. through but also being the conscience of our customers when working with partners mm -hmm. to go really are you really serious about this and what are you doing whilst also demonstrating with our distribution centers that that we're driving that agenda too because it, you know it is no longer a tick box exercise no. it is becoming really you know, really important and makes a difference. And also, I think our people are asking us and challenging mm -hmm. us in terms of what are we doing towards helping the yeah. environment. Um, and, and, it, and it becomes more critical, I think. You know, the one I, I think is, is most easy for the mass public to understand is electric vehicles. Yeah. So obviously there's legislation in the UK that's going to, you know, by 2030, require that no new petrol vehicles and um, are brought into the uh into the the country and so the question then goes well what does that mean yeah. and and i think this one is something people they get it and they go okay all electric vehicles what does that mean and what i think a lot of people are starting to to realize is it's not so much to say i bought my tesla or yeah. you know whatever vehicle but the infrastructure that goes with that and what needs to be at my house what needs to be at the supermarket what needs yeah. to be in this commercial building um, and everything that goes along with that, and and that's the the simplest form, I think, mm -hmm. of what we're seeing where people are really starting to understand that there's a whole infrastructure that's got to evolve for us to meet what the government has set up um, yeah. around energy efficiency and, and ultimately around saving the planet. Yeah, and, and I, I completely agree with that. And I think the need for innovation mm -hmm. and the constant involvement around Absolutely. that whole agenda will just continue. And again, that's where you can attract different talent into your organization, research and development that think differently, will try things fast and yeah. fail and move on and, and, and go again. Well, and I think people want to be part of the solution. I don't yeah. talk to anybody anymore who says, well, it's not real. Climate yeah. change isn't real. Nobody says that, nobody believes that anymore. But how to get started and the kinds of tools yeah. that you guys are launching and we're trying to launch to help make the process simpler and to say, okay, this tool spits out that you should go do these things mm -hmm. to help deliver around energy efficiency and sustainability um, are going to become more and more prevalent yeah. as we proceed because it's upon us, I think, to help answer those questions. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. And the more you think we can work collectively and co mm -hmm. collaboratively around thought leadership and how, how we do make a difference, will will really resonate i think with customers supplier partners and just the people in general colleagues employees so i think that makes a huge difference and from a social impact mm -hmm. are the things that are happening in in schneider that that you're really excited about i, I am so in july we're actually going to do our first all company volunteering day and this was um, off the back of COVID, we're, we're finding that we need to engage with people a little bit differently, that people's mindsets have evolved. I've always been quite passionate that we need to be active in the communities in which we have large populations of people. And so we agreed that we were going to try at, um, in the middle of July to do a volunteering day. And basically, we're going to shut down the business as a whole 
and allow all 4,000 employees, if they want, to go out and spend the day volunteering in our communities. And that, to me, is something different we haven't done before. We've always allowed people to, to go and volunteer and, and to take a day or two, but how do we do that as a collective? How do we really make a big impact? You know, you let 4,000 people, or let's say even half, you know, engage out into our communities, we're gonna have an impact and we're gonna make a difference. And so those are the kinds of things that we're trying to think about. A lot of that comes from feedback from our people mm. saying we, we want to engage in a different way. And, and where are you, you know, the closest way to engage is where you live. Mm. It's, it's the kind of thing you see every day. We're also a big employer in certain areas, especially where we have large factories. And, um, and so we, we need to be playing our part yeah. in those communities. So that's probably um, something that's coming up that I'm really excited about. Yeah, it's great to get involved in the communities. Mm. I mean, we, we try to operate at two levels in RS. So globally, we're a partner to the Washing Machine Project. I'm not sure if okay. you, you've no. ever heard of it. I would definitely look it up. So NAV, who founded that, used to work for a very well-known vacuum Okay. Innovative company, yeah. and but decided, you know, actually he wanted to make a difference. And when he went back to India and sat with his neighbour, um, he just used to watch her washing clothes for eight hours a day, back breaking, mm. travelling three, four hours to go and get water. So he made a handheld washing oh, machine, wow. which is transformed lives and, you know, RS, within RS, we've raised thousands of pounds, our colleagues doing events. We've spent volunteering days building washing machines that have gone to refugee camps, gone to orphanages in Uganda and, you know, supported Ukraine and, mm -hmm. and Poland, but also in the communities that we serve. So that's because globally we, we can support that. But then again, volunteering in the mm -hmm. communities were a big employer in Corby. So what can we do within that local community support? And I think when you talk to colleagues and they tell you about their volunteering experience, mm. you can really feel that it matters. And when you talk to people about what's important about working for RS, they'll say it's because we do that stuff yeah. as well and and I think that connects people to an organization well I think it does and you know Schneider through our foundation does a lot around access to energy it's one of the big topics there's still I think it's around a billion people in in the world who don't have consistent access to energy well you and I know that everything we do in a day yeah. does that and so Schneider's done a lot of work around small um, solar panels in Africa where basically it helps people to charge their phone because that's a way that they're creating commerce or to have light. Um, we sent those to Ukraine in the course of the war as well. So those kinds of things I think are are so interesting. And then, uh, but I'm also trying to bring it local. Yeah. Absolutely. For our people to say the foundation is doing amazing things around the world, but there's a lot of need here as well and you know one of the favorite my favorite things when i was in the u.s teams that we used to do was work with habitat for humanity which is a huge organization that builds homes around the world and it was a great team building exercise actually because you remove yourself from the day-to-day -day and you spend the time together it also gives you a really good perspective on the fact that there are things we can do to help and some of our day-to-day is maybe not uh, as bad as we make it out to be sometimes. Yeah. Our, yeah. Our, our traumas and our dramas <laughs> maybe aren't what other people are going through. Mm -hmm. so I think there's a real perspective building too. Um, and for me, I always like to, to bring our teams back to what are we trying to drive and deliver? And let's focus on what's important. Yeah. And then I think in big companies, sometimes you can also get really lost in the unimportant. Yeah. And, and these kinds of activities and being out in our communities and spending time with so many different people in Schneider as well, ultimately helps us serve our customers. Because in a big company, the more you know each other, the better off you are able to respond. And I think these are the kinds of things. So yes, so I'll keep you posted on, on how that goes in July, but we're definitely um, pretty excited about it. Well, it's been fantastic chatting to you, Kelly, and uh, hopefully we can inspire more females into this industry. Definitely. I have uh, a few ideas <laughs> I want to talk to you about. So. And, we'll, and we'll make a difference and leave a legacy Perfect. between us. Thanks a lot.